Hello and welcome to this week's video. This week's video is a photography question and answer video featuring questions from uh, two of my uh, photography classes at Highline College for winter quarter 2022. So um, before we get started with the questions and therefore the answers, uh, a couple of notes. Uh, note number one, one of my most common answers will be it depends. And the reason it depends is because a lot of this stuff is, is personal preference, personal opinion, uh, specific use cases and needs. So uh, I'll try and unpack a little bit of that each time I use that as my answer. It depends. Uh, the second thing to kind of just to get out front is that these are my opinions and based on my experience and my preferences. So uh, your mileage may vary, your experiences may vary, you may have even a very different opinion. Uh, that's what the comment section is for. So uh, let me know if you uh, think I messed up or if you have uh, some information you think I'm not aware of. Uh, I'd love to have that in the comments below. Speaking of below, while you're here, go ahead and hit that like button because you're gonna forget at the end of the video so do it now, get it out of the way. Anyway, so let's move on with uh, the topics for today. Uh, the topics for today are, here we go, photography business, camera gear. I sound like I'm on Jeopardy or something announcing categories. Uh, creativity and motivation, uh, camera settings and technique, editing software, and miscellaneous will finish us up today. So let's get started with the first question in the photography business category. So here we go. Question number one, how do you recommend I start a career in photography? And this will be my first use of it depends. Uh, the, the reason I say it depends is because um, everybody's a little different. Everybody has a different preference on how they want to get started in photography, but the, um, there's a couple things you can do. And one of the cool things about starting a photography business is you can do it at any time. It doesn't have to be a full-time job. It can get you started, get your feet wet, uh, just with some practice and letting people know that, hey, I'm a photographer. So that's the first step is deciding you want to do it. The second step is letting people know about it. Uh, and right along with that second step of letting people know is get legal with it in uh, wherever you are. Uh, in Washington State, it's a pretty easy process. You can uh, register your business online uh, and get a business license. I believe the, the state license, I think, is $25. And the uh, you will also need a license for the specific city you will be primarily conducting business. Um, so that's the kind of technical parts of things. Um, as far as uh, skill sets and things like that, uh, again, that's going to be varied on each person. But it's a great business to start almost any time. Uh, you can start uh, in lots of different ways. You can start as a portrait photographer. You can start selling stock photography, uh, which are photos you've taken and then you post on a website and someone might use and then they would pay a small fee for that. Uh, you can be a wedding photographer. You can be a sports photographer. You can be lots of different types of photographers. Uh, or maybe all of the different types, uh, or a YouTube photographer even. So um, there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, there's no, again, right way, one way to do it for sure, but find a way that you really enjoy where you're, the photos you're creating, the people you're working with, if you're working with people, are things you really enjoy because that'll help you do it for the longer term. So uh, find a way to enjoy it. Uh, the um, other thing I would recommend to be aware of is this. This is something not many people are aware of when they start any kind of creative business or work for themselves, uh, even if you're just doing it part-time. One thing to be aware of is the work that you're doing, let's say photography will be a very small portion of the time you spend doing the business part of things. Uh, let's say, uh, you know, for me, for example, it's probably 10 to 20% of what I do, the actual clicking of the camera. Uh, the rest of the time is, is administrative things, emails, client conversations, um, editing, um, other th lots of other things that are the the iceberg below the water kind of stuff. So just be aware of that if you if you enjoy taking photos, which is great, um, be aware that if you get into the business side of it, you won't be taking photos as often as you think. Okay. So next question: 
What do you think is the best way for more experienced and amateur photographers to build a name for themselves, to get known? Um, that's a really good question, and I, I don't have a specific answer because that's not something I've succeeded at. But here's what I think you might try. Lots of different things. Uh, one is you might contact local photographers in your area and talk to them about, uh, let them know that you're getting started. Hey, can I assist you? Uh, can I maybe carry bags, carry lights, carry stuff? Uh, can I come and just observe? Can I do a informational interview with you? So basically it's getting to know other people. Uh, other ways to do that would be to uh, maybe join local business groups such as chambers of commerce or networking groups uh, and uh, become known as a resource for photography in your area. Um, obviously, social media will help. Uh, at least it won't hurt. Uh, but being out there, having your portfolio, uh, your work available for view on, on social media is a good thing. Having your own website is a good thing. Writing about photography, uh, becoming an Expert is another way to go so that uh, other people will look to you uh, when they have questions, kind of like in this question and answer video. So again, there, it depends. There's lots of different ways to approach that, a way of getting your name out there, becoming known as a photographer. Um, but it uh, it is a process where you have to be proactive. Uh, if you wait for people to come to you, um, the, the algorithms will fight you. <laughs> So there you go. Get out there, tell people about it, connect with people, connect with other photographers, connect with local businesses, uh, write articles for, for blogs and magazines and, uh, I mean, uh, online sites and such, or, or magazines. Uh, and uh, that's a good way to go, potentially. Next question is opinions on something like a National Geographic wildlife photographer. Um, National Geographic has a reputation, obviously, of being a great uh, photography resource in that uh, a lot of the magazine is photographs. However, from what I understand, I don't know that they really have any staff photographers anymore. I believe everybody who photographs, or at least most, are um, freelance. So you would be assigned a project and you would get paid a small thing. and it's relatively small, believe it or not, uh, from what I understand. So you would, you would get this fee, but what it is, it's a portfolio builder. So hopefully it helps you get the next thing. It's, it's, it's a thing you put on your resume. Um, I, this is true of most uh, photography publications now, uh, Sports Illustrated, the other magazines that are out there. They're usually freelance. You're not hired by the magazine on an ongoing basis. It's, it's one project at a time, one project at a time, one project at a time. So um, unfortunately, that's the downside of photography business right now is there's, you're going to be working for yourself most of the time, uh, but you will have opportunity to work with other people, but you won't have a steady paycheck. Probably. If you get the opportunity to work with someone like National Geographic, that is a wonderful opportunity to take advantage of, and I hope you are able to do that. Uh, next question in the business category of photography, is food photography a good business to go into? And I would say yes, here's why. There's So for food photography, there's lots of different ways you could go with it. Uh, one way you can go is stock photography. So you would create photos uh, on your own of, of food that you like to photograph. So there's lots of different stock photography options where you could place your photos out there. And then as people have need for food photos, which lots of people do for, for restaurants, for magazines, um, for advertisings, and so on. So that's a high demand stock type of photo that uh, you would then be paid for. Now, here's the thing. Most of these stock photography sites are what's called royalty free, which means uh, they don't pay very much per photo. I mean, it's literally like 25 cents per download sometimes. Uh, sometimes it's a dollar, sometimes it's $10 might even be $20 for a high demand or maybe specific type photo, but it's not a lot of money per download. So you either have to have a lot of photos or get a lot of downloads. So uh, just be aware of that in the stock photography space. The other way to potentially do a business around uh, food photography is uh, with local restaurants where you photograph items for their menu, for their social media. Uh, then you would potentially want to investigate having some kind of lighting setup or be really, really aware of how to photograph in different settings and spaces, all the, the complications that come with that. Um, 
short version would be find a good window and put the food near it. <laughs> so um, next question is, how do you price your work as a photographer? Is there a base scale to follow? And this is another use of it depends on how do you price your stuff. Um, my process of creating a price has been to do a little research online. A lot of photographers will publish their price, at least if they're uh, in a wedding or portrait type photography business, uh, they will have prices listed online. So what I've done is I've done some research locally uh, in my area and I have found kind of the middle and I'm just slightly above the middle. So one of the factors in de determining my pricing structure is obviously the area I live, plus uh, my experience so far, uh, plus then right now, currently, photography is not my primary source of income. Teaching is. So um, I don't need to have it be at the top end of the market where I am uh, able to afford to continue to live where I live. And I don't want to be at the bottom just because there's always someone less expensive than you. So as you're starting, a good place to be might be uh, maybe in below whatever the halfway point is to get started, get experience. Uh, my suggestion is if you're uh, doing something professionally with someone else, never do it for free. Um, at least get lunch out of the deal. Uh, there's something psychological about connecting uh, a transaction to either money or tangible things versus just free or experience. Having said that, if you have an opportunity to do something for free that you would never ever get to do otherwise, it can, creates connections for you, uh, or is something that you want to continue to do lots and lots more of, that's a potential reason to consider free. But even then, I, I would suggest, you know, at least get 50 to 100 bucks uh, to cover gas, which is increasingly expensive. So um, that's a few thoughts on pricing. There's no one specific answer. Uh, it depends a little bit on where you live as well as the type of work you're doing. Next category is camera gear. So we're gonna get some gear questions here. First one is, what is your most le recommended lens for gym photography or athlete type photos? So unpacking that a tiny bit, trying to set some context, gym photos, I'm guessing it's not a very uh, bright space. So you're gonna want a lens that will have a large maximum aperture, lets in lots of light unless you're bringing your own lights. Uh, but if you uh, want maximum flexibility, you wanna use available light, then you wanna lens with an aperture of at least probably f2.8, 2.0, 1.4, something like that. Um, as far as which focal length to go with, um, that is gonna depend uh, on how close you wanna be to the subject, the type of story you wanted to tell with the subject, how much of the environment you need to include. Uh, so that's gonna vary a little bit. Uh, otherwise, with athlete type photos, uh, if they're actually doing the sports, uh, you probably want some kind of a telephoto lens uh, to be able to get specific athletes versus uh, a wider lens to get the whole uh, team. Uh, so again, it's going to vary for specific use. Uh, a zoom lens might be good. Uh, they will be a little more expensive, especially at the faster apertures f2.8, uh, but that would give you the most flexibility. Next question is, what camera is the best to invest in? That is a very much it depends question. Here is my short answer I always give when uh, starting answering this question. First, uh, if you buy a new camera these days, there's no bad cameras. So there only really cameras that you could go buy right now are, are good cameras. You can do amazing things with them. The second thing to remember when considering purchasing a camera, and this is the hardest thing for me to remember, there are no perfect cameras. No one camera, no matter how much money you spend, is gonna do everything you want exactly the way you want it to. So just be aware of that. Find the camera that works best for your budget, uh, what you're aware of as your needs, and then uh, secondly, uh, thirdly, I guess I can count, would be something that's gonna last you for a, a longer time. So one recommendation specifically I can make now in 2022 is I would not today buy a DSLR camera, a camera with a mirror, um, because all the manufacturers, uh, well, the, the ones who are still making them, Canon and Nikon, are not making any new ones. And they're discontinuing a lot of their lenses for those type of cameras 
So what I would recommend is look at a mirrorless camera, which all the manufacturers now have in their lineup and they're growing, um, those who are newer to it, Nikon and Canon, are growing their lens selections. So uh, that would be the way I would go. And the benefit to that type of camera is they're also really, really good video cameras or have video functionality in them at least. So mirrorless camera, find one that fits your budget. Be aware that there's no perfect cameras and that if you go buy a new camera these days, they're all really, really good. Uh, next, what camera do you suggest for landscape and portrait? Either of them, um, whatever camera you have. Uh, to be honest, uh, any camera is a landscape camera. Any camera is a portrait camera. Those two specific types of photography are not generally particularly demanding on cameras as far as technical specifications. So uh, that's where you, a, an entry level camera will do well. What you'll want to invest in for both of those types of uh, photography, a landscape and portrait though, is quality lenses, which oftentimes can easily cost more than the camera or you'll have more money invested in your lenses than you do in the camera itself. So uh, no specifics here. Again, it's gonna depend, um, but um, any of the cameras that are out there these days will do well. See the previous answer, no perfect cameras and no uh, bad cameras these days. So any of them will do a really, really good job. Although I will add one thing on the landscape side of thing, depending on what you're doing with your landscape photography, uh, if you're in um, environmental conditions where there's rain or snow or dust or that kind of thing, you're going to want a camera that has weather sealing. That would be an important feature to look for. Um, weather resistant. They're not waterproof, dustproof, snowproof, but they're more rugged than those that are not having those features. Next question, what is the bare minimum kit that you take with you when trying to pack as lightly as possible? What would I consider to be the bare minimum? Well, one camera, one lens. That's it. I would take uh, something like this, which is uh, my Fujifilm X-T3 with a zoom lens that covers wide angle at 16 millimeters to 80 millimeters on the telephoto end. Uh, so I can do quite a bit of the type of photography I like and enjoy with this lens. And uh, I just have to carry one thing and don't have to worry about uh, changing lenses or doing uh, much that way and potentially being clumsy guy and dropping things. Been there and done that. So uh, one camera, one lens, that's, that's the bare minimum. Uh, if you can even be more minimal and get a, a smaller lens, a prime lens, and just do that. Uh, I like personally to have the uh, flexibility of a zoom lens. Uh, I've just gotten used to that as the way I photograph. In fact, on the last session when I went out, I had three lenses with me, but I only used this one, the 16 to 80. Uh, so there you go. Uh, next question, uh, what about filters are recommended for new photographers or maybe any photographers? Um, personally, I don't really use filters uh, as just something that's always on my lens. As you can see, there's no filter on here. Uh, what you're seeing there in the kind of green reflection, that is the coating on the lens to uh, uh, deal with uh, reflections, refractions, and whatever else light does in the front of the lens. Uh, but as far as filters, what's really common to put on the front of most cameras, and you usually are going to get sold this if you go to a camera store, they're going to recommend it, is what's called a UV filter. And it's unnecessary because this already has UV on it. The, uh, but the one advantage to putting a UV filter on the front element of your camera uh, camera lens is that is relatively inexpensive insurance for your camera. Um, let's say you bumped into something and cracked this. Um, that's expensive to repair or replace. Uh, if it just was a 40-ish dollar filter on there, obviously that's going to be less expensive than your lens. Now having said that, as far as filters that you would just leave on, like a UV filter, if you buy a $10 one, you're going to probably, which is inexpensive for camera stuff, you're going to probably run into problems where your autofocus system is maybe struggling to focus because it's, there's something interfering with it from that filter. Additionally, those inexpensive filters might have a lot of flares with them. So if you point it near a, light, a strong light source, you might get all kinds of stuff diffracting inside of your, you know, that show up in your photo. So be aware of that. Um, if you're going to put something on lenses which are several hundred dollars usually uh that's only ten dollars or twenty dollars or thirty even um 
it's going to be now the lowest common denominator as far as affecting your image quality and it might not look as good as you'd like. Also, as I mentioned, it might affect autofocus performance. That occasionally happens as well. So I don't have filters on all the time. The kinds of filters I will use occasionally are what's called a circular polarizing filter for reflections in clouds and water. Um, the other filter I will use occasionally is called a neutral density filter, which is basically like sunglasses for your camera. So if you're on a sunny day and you want uh, exposure that's longer, but it's too bright to get there normally, you would just take some of the, the sun out of that sunny day with that neutral density filter. There you go. So short answer, I don't recommend putting filters on all the time. Put them on when you need them. Next question, when creating photos, when is it appropriate to use the flash on the camera? And my answer for that will be hardly ever. The reason I say hardly ever to use the flash that's on your camera, so like this kind of camera with the, this little tiny flash, is that when this flash is uh, in your photo, when it's making light that affects your photo, this is a very, very small light source. So you're gonna get light that is two things that are problematic in the photo. One, it's a small light source, so it's gonna have very hard shadows, which if you're photographing a person is generally not very flattering to their face. The second thing that is makes the photo look a little strange is because the light source is coming directly at your subject, which is hardly ever where the light is coming from. Usually light is coming from above or from the sides and not straight at you. So what happens is on a face, if you're using a light that's pointing straight at you, what happens is you lose the shadows. So you lose the shadows under the cheeks, under the eyes, under the nose, under the chin. So the face becomes flattened, uh, which looks a little strange. And then any shadows that are thrown will be on maybe the wall behind you. So you get this big second person in the photo. Uh, so that's why I don't recommend using these. Uh, the quality of the light, Hard shadows, not very attractive. Direction of the light straight at the subject, again, not generally very attractive. Now, can you do it? Yes. Should Could you do it when there's no other way to create the photo? You bet. But uh, by and large, I would recommend not using that flash. Uh, use the other con uh, exposure controls on your camera, increase your ISO, use maybe a slower shutter speed, maximum aperture, so that you can still create a photo that looks good without having that kind of nasty, tiny light directional straight at you. Next question is, of all the uh, of all that I own, which lens is my favorite? Um, I'm gonna answer that two ways. <laughs> Not quite, it depends, but two ways. Uh, the first way I'll answer this question is by uh, answering it, which lens do I use the most? And currently that is the lens I mentioned earlier, the 16 to 80 zoom lens. Uh, it's on my camera as a starting point to almost everywhere I go. Uh, it's a great lens as far as flexibility and image quality. Uh, and it's not super large and it's not, as far as lenses go, super expensive. So as far as the lens I use the most is gonna be this 16 to 80 zoom. As far as my favorite lens, the lens that uh, I use when I create portraits, especially head, uh, headshot portraits, when uh, I'm at weddings and wanna get some uh, close-ups and things like that, the lens I'll use is this. This is the uh, 50 to 140 f 2.8 zoom lens. It's quite large, quite heavy as you can see. It's quite large, lets in a lot of light, but the image quality is just fantastic on this. Um, I just used it yesterday when I was doing uh, some headshots in Seattle. So uh, I really, really like this lens. Uh, it's The image quality is, again, as I mentioned, spectacular. So this would be my kind of desert island lens along with this, uh, just to cover all the bases. Uh, it is a more of a commitment to use this lens. It's, it's physically larger. That's how you make it have great image quality with uh, lots of light in the image. So uh, there you go. That's my favorite lens, the 50 to 140. The next question is what camera or gear is essential for both street and portrait photography? And this one, the answer to this is, is similar to the question about landscape and portrait in that 
whatever one you do and depending on how you like to create those types of photos. Um, there's no one system that's going to work. What works for me may not work for someone else as far as their preference of the way they like to tell stories, the way they like to create images. So uh, I don't have a specific answer. Uh, I think if you're trying to, when you're getting started, your, your budgets are limited. A zoom lens is a good place to start because um, they have lots of flexibility and you can do multiple things with one lens that you wouldn't be able to do with a, with a single prime lens. Um, as far as the camera itself, again, uh, street and portrait, uh, mirrorless cameras are nice because they're quieter. Uh, there's less mechanical elements moving. So if I take a picture with this, this lens, of this camera, excuse me, not very loud. If I create a photo with this camera. So when I create a photo with this camera, it sounds like this, quite a bit louder. So street photography, where you're trying to be uh, inconspicuous, that's, that's a little harder to do with this. Um, if you're doing a camera like this, it's quieter, uh, especially if you have a smaller lens on here. It's again, inconspicuous, which is generally a thing you try and do with street photography. So no specifics, but uh, just a couple general ideas there. Uh, next question in the gear category is what can be done to make sure you get the best possible photo while using an, a phone camera and what things can I adjust on the phone is buying a lens for a phone worth it? So a couple questions here about phone photography. Um, my short answer is just like um, a, a, a camera camera, the, the most important thing in creating interesting photos is where you place the camera, how you create the composition, how you place the camera relative to the subject you're creating photos of, the light that's on your subject, the interestingness of the subject. So you still have the same things, uh, elements in creating a photo with a phone as you do with a camera. The other thing to be aware of with a phone is there's some limits on the phone as far as, especially if it's lower light. So make sure you got lots of light. That's a good place to start with a phone photo. photo. Uh, and then the other thing that is cool about phones is generally speaking, they will focus much closer uh, you can get your camera closer to your subject. Let's see, I'm still focusing. You can see this camera isn't focusing. Video camera can't focus on the phone, but the phone can focus on the video camera. Actually, let me show you by taking a quick picture. So there's a picture of the camera from just a couple inches away where the camera could not focus on the phone. So that's one of the cool things. Get closer to your subject. Uh, that's... Um, kind of my go-to when I'm working on photos of almost anything, but especially ordinary things that aren't that interesting by themselves, put the camera in an interesting place, put the phone in an interesting place and start by getting closer. Um, as far as is buying a lens for a phone worth it, uh, again, that's, that's going to depend. What happens when you put a lens on a phone is now the phone doesn't fit in your pocket uh, or your purse or whatever, your bag. Uh, you got this thing sticking out here but it does give you more flexibility, more options um, sometimes. But um, I think especially on the newer phones, this phone has three different lenses, three different cameras. So it can do a wide angle shot, ultra wide. It can do a normal and a, and a telephoto all in without any additional lenses. So if you have a newer phone, I don't know that a, an additional lens is either necessarily practical or certainly helpful. So there you go. Next category is creativity and motivation. Uh, so let's see what the question is. The first question is, in your personal experience, how do you find ways to continue creating new things? Asking the context of, you know, going to the same place, creating the same photos uh, and struggling to get past that. And that's a really, really good question. Um, I think for me, the way I've uh, found motivation uh, when I'm using the same ideas is, is a couple things. If you're going to the same place, same subjects, um, if you enjoy the process, that's a big thing. The other thing is if you're familiar with stuff, the advantage of that, of, of a location or a subject is that opens you potentially to other places, other photographs that could happen in that vicinity. So even for example, when I go photograph the same buildings I photograph in downtown Bellevue, I might notice something on the walk to or from there or in the neighborhood or on the ground uh, because I'm in the same place. 
The other thing that can change if you go back multiple times is go back when the light is different or the weather or the atmosphere is different. Uh, that's another way to add interest, uh, make it different. Um, you know, go on a rainy day, go on a sunny day, go on, go at night, uh, go when it's snow, go when it's fog, uh, when it's foggy. All those different things, those different atmospheric elements can give you different photos in the same place. So it, it's work, honestly, to, you know, to find new ways to be creative around the same old thing. But um, I enjoy that process. I think it takes a good challenge. Um, and uh, again, because it's, it, it, one of the advantages to going to the same place and using the same subjects is you reduce a little friction if you're like me and don't like change and new things sometimes. Uh, I'm going to go to the place I'm comfortable and let's create some images. Um, oh, another uh, way to do that is, uh, for example, when I go to Bellevue Botanical Garden, we'll probably go there five or six times a year, go at different seasons. It looks very different in the winter than it does in the spring, than it does in the summer and the fall. So seasons are another way to add uh, interest and motivation to go back to the same old place. In class, I talk about uh, ways to stay motivated to even just go out and create photos anywhere. And, uh, and the question is, how do you do that when you just don't feel like it? One of my suggestions as you're asking this question and thinking about this is, is, to, is to examine and ask the question, why am I even considering creating something? Why am I thinking about getting the camera and going out? What's my motivation? So depending on your motivation, I think that depends a little bit on how you might answer this question. So let's go back here and let me talk about what I mean by this. So for example, let's, let's pretend this line is the continuum of uh, motivation with uh, two ends. And on the two ends are art. So I'm creating photos purely for art. I'm creating it because it's just for me. It does something for me. Just the physical act of creating that thing is all I need as the motivation to create it. And then the other far end of the spectrum of this continuum is money, is profit, is, is because uh, it's the way I am able to afford the things I need in my life. So you can have those two extremes, uh, someone who's creating just simply to get paid and someone's creating just because they need to, want to for them. And I think for most of us, we're somewhere in the middle. Um, the reasons we create might involve, yes, we'd be love to get paid for it, and we want to create something that is meaningful to ourselves. Personally, I tend to live a little bit on the, the art end of things, I'll st and I think this is a good place to, for most people to be. If, if you start with creating things that are first for you, things you enjoy, have meaning to you, are important to you, have value to you, um, do something that is because of yourself, that's going to be able to be sustained longer term. Plus, I think your connection to what you're creating will show up in what you're creating. So if you start from there, if you enjoy the process, if you enjoy the thing you create, if you enjoy the reactions you get, that would that gives me tons of motivation personally to keep creating photos. And that's one of the reasons I really enjoy photography is it's an art form that is easy for me to share with other people and easy for other people to understand and enjoy. An example I use is when I was doing lots and lots of graphic design, it wasn't, most people weren't excited to see the, the insurance company logo I had created. They had no connection to it. it. You know, it was, you know, it was an insurance company logo. But if I create a photo of a flower, if I create a photo of an interesting building or interesting weather, um, people can connect to that, relate to that and enjoy it more than that insurance company logo. So that's my motivation. Um, I, I know that also, even if I'm not feeling like creating photos, if once I start creating photos, then I start feeling like creating photos. So if I make it a priority, make it a commitment, put it on my schedule, either in my brain or literally on my calendar, that is another way that I stay motivated is if I know I'm going to do it, then I'm going to do it. 
especially if I tell someone, or I have a YouTube channel where I'm a, uh, I've set a schedule of creating something once a week. That's another way to get motivated is to have an audience that is expecting something uh, on a regular basis. On to the next category, camera settings and technique. Technique. I think that's the French pronunciation. So here we go. How do I know what lens to use? What lens should I use when taking close-up photos? Uh, how do you know what lens to use? Are you ready? It depends. Uh, it's, it's so variable. Uh, every photographer, I think, as you're, the more you do it, you'll tend to gravitate towards certain either focal lengths or certain types of lenses, certain types of photos. So that will become your usual tool to use. Uh, I know portrait photographer, I'm aware of portrait photographers who take, uh, create photo portraits with wide angle lenses that you don't normally use. I'm aware of landscape photographers that use telephoto lenses, super telephoto lenses, where you normally would use a wide angle. So different answers for different people. Use a lens that you enjoy. Use the lens you have. Uh, a, a former student uh, in, the, in this class, um, she had one lens and she ran her photography wedding business on that a 50 millimeter lens and she took all her photos with that and she did that for a number of years before she got a second lens but uh, she used the lens she had so use what you have start there as far as close-up photos that is um, a special kind of lens called a macro lens if you want to be able to get really really close to your subject as i showed in the answer to the phone question uh, most camera lenses, their minimum, it's called minimum focusing distance, is anywhere from six, eight inches to 18 inches to two feet. Um, so if you want to get closer than that, you need a special lens or this. This is called, these are called extension tubes. And what they do is they go on your camera body. So I'm going to put the tubes on the camera. And then I attach the lens to the tubes. And now this turns this lens into a close focusing only lens. Um, and so now I can get, I think this lens, I can get about four inches away from my subject and I can get quite a bit of magnification that way. It's not a true macro lens, uh, but it's as um, well, the advantage to this is I can put it on all of my lenses and it works differently with different lenses, but uh, it's about $70 versus multiple hundreds to low thousand dollars uh, uh, for a specialty macro lens. So uh, I like to use extension tubes because they work with all of my lenses and uh, I can just take it on, take it off as I need. Uh, next question is what's uh, the best settings to take moving car photos to get the car to be still and the background to be moving? Uh, to do that, that technique is called panning. So what you do is you follow the motion of whatever's moving, in this case the car, and you match the speed of the vehicle, the subject, and you follow that and you're clicking photos as you're following the, the, the moving object. And what that'll do is blur, potentially blur the background. It as far as what shutter speed, which is what affects the appearance of motion in your photo, that's going to vary depending on how fast the subject is moving, how far away you are, how fast you have to move to track it. You can take some experimentation. For race cars, you're probably going to be at one two hundredth of a second or faster. For a runner, uh, probably about sixtieth of a second or faster. Um, depending on how close you are. So you will change the shutter speed to control how sharp your subject is relative to the blur of the background, relative to how fast you're moving. Um, so there are lots of videos I'm sure you can watch on YouTube that will show you the different techniques for this. It's a technique you have to practice to get good at. Um, I, I'm okay at it because uh, I don't practice it very much. Most of my subjects aren't moving. So it's, it's, a, it's art and science of understanding how shutter, the science of shutter speed and, and light capturing works with the uh, art of what you're trying to show in the story you're creating. Um, another up close photo question. Uh, my best photos are taken up close, but they're not the best. Sometimes I can only get this close. So this is a similar answer to the uh, a phone of the other question about getting close to your subject. And you, what you have to deal with is what's called the minimum focusing distance of your lens. And as I mentioned, most lenses 
will be six to 12 inches, probably closer to 12 inches. It's as close as they can get. So that's again where you would use the extensions tubes to get closer or a specialty lens called a macro lens. I, I really like close-up photography because it gives us a view of the subject that's different than when we're normally looking at it with our eyes. And that's one way to create interest in your subject in your photos is to create a look that normally isn't seen as you're just observing it. So um, macro lens, uh, would be a, a place to start if you want a specialty close-up lens or again these extension tubes which are anywhere from $30 to $120 depending on quality and such and the manufacturer. Uh, I really like this brand. This is called Velo. I've had good luck with them. These are about five or six years old and they just work really well. They're mostly metal uh, and on the, at least on the back side where they connect to the camera. So very happy with that. Uh, I tried taking a photo of the moon the other night and I didn't have the correct gear. I was wondering why it shows up as a white blob. Are there ways to take a photo if it's a crescent or a full moon without meshing and mushing together? So uh, here's the answer to this question. Um, the answer to this question is the technique that you use to create a photo of, of the moon at night is you use manual exposure. The reason for that is it, it's a really tricky exposure because you have a very bright light source, the moon, which is brighter than we think uh, against the black sky. So if you let the camera's automatic system do that, it's probably gonna try and average the dark and the very small amount of very bright, and it's gonna therefore create kind of just this blo glowing blob of white in the middle of your screen for the moon. So you have to use manual exposure. Uh, you're probably going to want a tripod to support your camera because you might be getting into exposures that are getting um, longer. So you might have camera motion that's going to add a blur to your a subject that you don't want. The other thing you probably want is a telephoto lens. You need to reach out and get the moon to be larger in the frame so that it's obviously the moon and not just a glowing blob in the middle of your screen. So here is an example. So this photo of a crescent moon uh, was on this camera with uh, a, a 70 to 300 lens and a two times teleconverter. So it becomes a 600 millimeter lens, uh, a relatively high ISO. So lots of amplification of light at ISO 6400 and an aperture of F11. So a relatively small opening trying to get some extra sharpness. But look at the shutter speed. That's 1 1 25th of a second. Uh, relatively fast shutter speed at night. Um, again, to help with uh, sharpness when you're that long a focal length, uh, you get into all sorts of movement and things like that. So you want any kind of movement frozen. So that's why that shutter speed. So um, this kind of photo of the moon, you still have some details um, and you don't have just that blob of blurry white in the middle of your photo. So manual exposure, tripod, telephoto lens, and a correct exposure settings to get you to the moon. Uh, next question, is there a specific technique to photographing moving subjects like children? They're very hyper and like to move around a lot. That's a good observation. So here's the, the technique. Uh, there's two things uh, related to here and connected here. Uh, well, actually there's three. There's gonna be three settings you're gonna set on the camera. Uh, it's, there's, first is gonna be uh, shutter speed, uh, depending on how much of that motion you wanna freeze uh, and make it look like they're not moving. Um, so you would use a faster shutter speed for that. The second setting you need to set on your camera is the autofocus setting, and you're gonna want to have continuous autofocus. So as your subject is moving, the cam if they're changing distance, the camera will continually focus instead of just the first time you half press on the button, if you're in single autofocus, then it's gonna, let's say it focuses on my hand here, and if I move my hand to a different distance, it's not gonna refocus. Um, so you wanna have continuous focus, you want a, a shutter speed to control the motion the way you want. And then the last thing you're gonna want is uh, uh, your burst mode. Your How many photos does it take as you hold down the button? So 
So let me show it to you really quick. So uh, this is in a burst mode with continual honest fo focus and I'm following a subject. So it's taking a whole bunch of photos uh, at this camera. It's about 10 frames per second doing that. So you get a whole bunch of photos and in that one, you might have a cool frozen moment of time that captures the motion the way you want. So three settings, shutter speed to deal with motion the way you want, continuous autofocus, and some kind of burst mode to have a whole sequence of photos that's gonna hopefully capture that individual moment you're looking for. The next category is editing and software. A couple questions here. First question is, do you have to edit all your photos? Can you have a good photo without editing? And my answer to that would be yes and no. <laughs> I guess no and yes. Do you have to edit all your photos? No. Can you have a good photo without editing? Yes. Uh, in my opinion, editing is for finishing photos, is for adding that uh, extra bit of your personality, your visual voice to an image. Uh, also, you can use it to correct some minor problems. Uh, so no, you don't have to edit every photo, although I do. And can you have a good photo without editing? Yes, but I don't have very many that I have never edited. So um, while it's possible, I think the tools are there. Uh, just like in the traditional darkroom of uh, black and white photography where you had a negative and you were making prints, those photos were, were edited either by cropping what was in the image or by using exposure uh, variability by hiding exposure from one part or adding to another part of a part of a photo so they were doing editing of the photos even back in the traditional darkroom days so it's not something new um next question is can uh, related to that first question can solely editing a photo change the story of that photo can doing so make the photo better or worse or is it all individual preference um i for me uh I don't think software can rescue a photo. If it's, if it's not an interesting photo to begin with, editing in software isn't gonna make it interesting unless you <laughs> are in Photoshop and adding stuff to it. Um, so for me, software like Lightroom that I use is not to rescue a photo, it's to finish a photo. So, but it can totally change the story, yes. So I can take a photo that's maybe, um, a normal average exposure and make it darker and moody, uh, make it uh, change the color a little bit to make it again feel moodier, make it more blue or make it warmer and sunnier and, and maybe happier feeling uh, by going with some more uh, warm tones in the image. So yes, you can change the story, but you're not going to rescue uh, a photo that just isn't that interesting to begin with. Uh, as in the first question about do you have to edit all your photos? Yeah, it's personal preference. Uh, but for me, it's a process I enjoy. So if you enjoy the process, add it to your repertoire, make time for it. Uh, I spend maybe two to three minutes of photo usually at most on the editing. So it's not a ton of time, but it does get me to where I want to be with each photo. And um, it really helps me feel like the photo is more mine. Last category is miscellaneous. All the things that didn't quite fit anywhere else. Kind of like me. So here's the first question. Would it be considered bad to only want to photograph certain cultures of things? I'm very connected with my heritage and love clicking photos of things that connect with it. Although I am not sure if it would come off as arrogant or ignorant for solely photographing my culture. And my answer would be to this. I don't think it's bad at all. I think it's awesome that you want to um, photograph something you enjoy, something that's important to you, something you're connected to. Uh, when those things happen, you enjoy it, you're connected, and it's important to you. Uh, I think that shows up in the photos we create, the art we make. So that's a great place to start. Uh, and as long as you're enjoying it, that's awesome. Um, there's no one way to create photos, create art, art um, and there's, you know, we all do it differently. We all have unique perspectives to bring. So celebrate your culture, enjoy it, show it to the rest of us so that we can learn from it too. I think that's a wonderful thing. Next question, do I prefer color photos or black and white? Um, 
It depends. It depends on the photo. Um, I really do like black and white. Uh, the last set of photos I did was black and white, and I, I forgot how much I enjoyed that, uh, how it, it simplifies things, and it, it helps me look at things differently. So uh, I do enjoy black and white quite a bit. That's where I started. But I also enjoy color quite a bit. I mean, that's the world we see, the world we live in. Uh, it's a great uh, emotional content to photos can be in the color, so I want to leverage that and use it. So it depends. Most of my photos are in color, uh, and um, I use black and white either for uh, a creative jump start or when I want to go for a specific mood or story in the photo. Uh, what are some challenges you faced in photography that have not gotten easier to overcome with experience and practice? And I, I had to read this question twice because I thought I, I had a different answer because I forgot the word not gotten easier in there. So here's something that's never gotten easy for me in my photography business side of things is I've never gotten really good at advocating uh, and being comfortable with the pricing of my, uh, my work. Uh, I always think, oh, they're not going to want to pay that. So I, that's something I'm still working on, you know, almost 20 years into doing this to be comfortable and confident in the pricing I'm uh, putting out there to know that it's uh, both valuable to me and valuable to the person on the other end. So that's uh, one of those imposter syndrome kind of things that uh, most of us adults have where we think we're not uh, the thing we say we are or are known for. Uh, so that's something I'm still working on, growing in, and um, probably be working on for the rest of my life. So yeah, that's one thing. There's others, but that's the one I'll talk about right now. Um, another question, this could have been, I guess, in the editing question, but is the photo more important or the edit? Uh, but I'm going to stick with uh, the answer that says the photo is more important. Uh, again, if you don't have a photo that's a good structure to start from, a good foundation, the edit is not going to rescue it unless you're doing some major surgery in Photoshop. So the photo is most important. It always is. Get it as much the way you want, the, the, get the important elements done in your camera, whether your camera is this kind of camera or your phone, get it the way you want here and then finish it in the edit. Uh, what advice do you have for someone who has a lot of shyness when taking photos in public? Um, I have an answer for that and uh, because I'm kind of that way. Uh, I'm a little self-conscious when I'm out in public with my camera creating photos. Uh, so what I do is I go when there's not a lot of people. So for example, uh, I go to downtown Bellevue and create photos a lot of times there, but I'll usually go on the weekends when there's not the business folks around. So I can go photograph buildings, get close to them and not have people wondering what I'm doing or, or, uh, in the photos or asking me questions. So so that's the place I start is go at times when people aren't around. Another time to do that is early in the morning before the, the crowds show up uh, or potentially later at night, depending on your comfort with evening or how late the sun is setting at that time of year. So um, that's one way. Uh, another way to deal with it is just to remember that even though we feel like everybody's looking at it, most of looking at us, most of the time they're not. They're doing their own thing. They're in their own worlds. They may see us with a camera, but they go, oh, nothing going on there. Move on with your day. So be aware that most people, they may notice you, but they're not noticing you. So <laughs> uh, just practice that a little bit. Uh, the more you do it, the more comfortable you potentially will get. But be aware of that. If, if you're not super comfortable with it, then, then don't do it. Um, because that's going to, again, get in the way of the art, create friction, create resistance to what you want to do and and that's never fun so uh, find ways to still do what you create photos in a way that you can still enjoy it and that's going to be different for all of us uh, another way to be more confident uh, in creating photos when you're out in public is to create photos in places where people are expecting photos to be taken so for example here in seattle at pike place market Lots of people are creating photos there. Uh, if you're at a national park and, uh, you know, people have cameras out, they're creating photos. So uh, that's one other way to do it is be in places where it's kind of normal for photos, folks to have cameras and be creating photos. Uh, 
Uh, next uh, kind of question in the miscellaneous category is what composition elements would help create moody and dark images? Um, those kind of things, uh, think a little bit about, okay, so what creates mood? Um, generally, we think of, of darker tones when we think of moody. We think of cooler tones and colors. Uh, so those kind of things. Subject matter will also change what we think of as dark and moody. Uh, tiny smiling babies aren't considered dark and moody, but uh, maybe a, a wrinkled leaf uh, that's all dried up might be considered dark and moody. So it's time of day, it's the type of light, it's the subject matter. Um, you can then finish how the moodiness feels in the edit when you get to the software and uh, play with contrast and different exposure elements as well as color. So um, lots of different ways to do that. Look up hashtag moody on Instagram and there's going to be some inspiration there as well. <laughs> Next question, what subjects do I consider most interesting? And, and for me, one of the things I find most interesting is just ordinary stuff uh, all around us every day that um, we just walk by. That when you point a camera at it in an interesting perspective, interesting angle relative to the subject, you create something new and maybe that is unseen out of something that's ordinary. Uh, so I, I do that a lot by looking down, by noticing things that are, again, normal, looking for textures, looking for patterns and shapes and repetition, uh, looking for little details on a bigger thing that might by itself just be interesting. And then people go, what is that? And I can tell the story. So uh, I like to create mystery in photos uh, of subjects that, uh, again, People don't know what it is because they've walked by it and, and never really looked at it in detail. Uh, that's one thing I enjoy. Uh, I also enjoy large scenes uh, like architecture uh, and landscape. So there's lots of different things I enjoy, uh, but my I, I call it ordinary beauty is kind of my favorite thing. It's just where something is just ordinary, but with the camera and cutting, removing everything else from it, but just this little slice of life, it becomes extra beautiful. So that's what I really enjoy. Uh, next up is how do you find what your specialty is when it comes to taking photos? For example, being good at taking pictures of nature or technical photography, etc. cetera. Um, I think the answer to that is pay attention to what you pay attention to. So notice what you notice. Notice the things that you're drawn to, to creating photos of over and over again. So uh, look at your past history of photos and see what shows up most often. Um, one of the things you can look at is look and see if there's colors that show up. Look and see if there's subjects that show up uh, repeatedly. Look and see if there's like times of days or locations, things like that. So your history is you're building your specialty through time. Uh, and also if you uh, think about how much you enjoyed creating the photos, if you didn't enjoy the photos, if you got the reaction you wanted, if you didn't get the reaction you wanted. So all those things go into it. And one of the awesome parts of photography is we all get to do this differently. So there's again, no one way to take a photo of a building, to create a photo of a person, to create a photo in the Grand Canyon. They're all different ways that we all get to do it differently, which is a combination of our unique personalities, our unique experiences, our unique genetics that uh, we each bring to our photos. So it's a fun process to notice what you enjoy. It's also fun to see how that changes over time. I know I'm creating different photos now than when I was in high school and even different photos than when I was 10 years ago, I'm doing it in a different way. And there, there's little evolutions and that's hopefully growth. That's hopefully change and hopefully just a reflection of who I am as a human being at any given point. So I hope the same is true for you as you're creating photos and asking these kind of questions about what's my style, what's my voice. This question is kind of similar to that previous one. How can I succeed in finding my own technique and skills create a different POV as a starter, so a different point of view. Um, again, just notice what you notice. Notice what you're doing over and over again. Uh, what you enjoy the most, I think is one of the most important things to pay attention to. So the photos that you enjoy, the subjects that you are most excited about, the subjects you return to, that's your style, that's your perspective, that's your point of view. So. 
uh, pay attention to it, examine it, think about it, notice it. Uh, a lot of times I think we just create photos without thinking about it. So asking that question is a great place to start in answering the question. Uh, this question, how long did it take you to get good at photography or have you always been good at it? Uh, I haven't always been good at it. Uh, I've been taking photos for a long, long time. I got my first camera when uh, I graduated eighth grade. So as I was entering high school and I took photos a ton. I was that guy with the camera all through high school and early part of college. Um, but most of my photos weren't good. They were documentary photos of people in my life. But I, when I created a photo that was law, it was more luck than any intention. Uh, I don't think I got really good at photography until my son was in high school and in his senior project, he started, he, his senior project was photography and I was his mentor or, or guide or whatever you want to call it. And as I was watching him create photos, a whole new thing happened for me, which is noticing what he was doing with composition. And I, uh, I was taking photos of him taking photos and I must have 20 or 30 photos of him laying down on the ground, of him light up against stuff, looking straight up. Uh, all these interesting camera perspectives and noticing things that I had walked by. So that's kind of my inspiration is watching him create photos and think, oh, that's what you do. You don't just stand here at normal height, but put the camera in an interesting place. The second kind of revelation in my photography education and getting good at this, hopefully, is when I started teaching uh, about uh, 11 years ago in 2011. So in teaching photography, I had to really dig into understanding how exposure worked, how white balance worked, how the different camera controls work, because I was going to share that with other people. So in understanding that better, all of a sudden, all these light bulbs went off and I was like, oh, that's now I have more control of creating the stories I want to create in the photos I'm creating. So um, it's been a long journey. It took about 30 years to get from the first camera to really understanding how exposure works. And now it's been 11 plus years working on it and, and digging deeper into it and uh, finding even more joy in it as I create photos and it becomes more a part of who I am and how I uh, share my art. So a long, long journey that's not done yet. And that's pretty exciting. Next question. Do you ever break rules in photography? Do you have any tips on that if you do? Um, so my answer to this is going to be, yeah, of course. There's, especially in making art, uh, which is, you know, an expression of our, has an element of our own self in it, which is going to be unique and different from everybody else. Of course, you're going to break rules. You're going to do things differently than either the normal, the expected, or what everybody else is doing. So yeah, break rules. Uh, how to, the tips on that is feel free to do it. Uh, be aware that uh, even though you know there is the rule of thirds, which I like to call the suggestion of thirds, because I don't like rules in creating art, is understand what the maybe the norms are what's usual so you can understand whether that's something that's important and uh, interesting to you or whether you want to go in a different direction. But you, you do have to understand a little bit, I think, of what the, the basics are so that you can decide how the way you want to do things either fits in with that or doesn't, the directions you want to go. Um, and again, it's gonna, you're, you're gonna change over time as to how important the, the rules may be to what you're creating. Sometimes it's more important, sometimes not so important. Um, and sometimes you want to follow the rules and sometimes they're like, not so important today. Uh, it depends on what you're doing, who you're doing it for, what your intent is. But um, I would say uh, break the rules all the time. And, you know, I, I like to say when, you know, they, they say think outside the box. I like to say when we're making art, why are we even talking about boxes? Uh, let's just create some stuff. So that's a good place to start, I hope. Uh, the next question, what's a good way to create an interesting photo out of an everyday subject? For example, an object in my house or any other ordinary subject. Um, for me, my answer to this is get closer. Put the camera in a place where you don't normally put your eye. Put the camera. So again, getting closer is a good way to start. Uh, 
watch what light is doing, uh, find interesting details. Uh, one of the things I think we tend to do is take a picture of the whole thing rather than finding an interesting element, an interesting portion of the the larger thing. So look for details, look for uh, you know maybe uh, the way light is interacting and get closer with your camera. So I'm gonna show you some examples so uh, that I'm not just talking about this so you can see something. So here's a couple of examples of both detail and getting closer. These photos are taken with my phone. Uh, so the photo on the left here is uh, just one of those things you pull down a lamp to turn it off and on. Uh, on the right is uh, details on a basket with just living room light on it. Uh, this set of photo is uh, a little paper light we have. It's shaped in a star. Uh, again, not showing the whole thing and getting closer between the first photo on the left and the second photo on the right. So you see details, you see textures, you see patterns and repetition. Uh, it becomes more abstract the closer you get. A uh, glass of water on the kitchen counter with uh, a, uh, the overhead uh, vent light on it uh, creates this interesting little shadow. Again, phone photo down close and low, interesting perspective. You don't normally look at a glass of water from here. This is a lid to a saucepan uh, with some drain holes in it. Again, with the light shining through it, camera up close, uh, not showing the whole thing, just some details. So there's a few ways you can create photos of everyday objects. Again, look for details, get closer, watch what the light's doing. Um, they're all around you. It's just a matter of, uh, not just, it's a practice of looking for them, noticing it, and then uh, being willing to get your camera out and create some photos of the way all that stuff looks to you. And the last question, and I saved this for last and I marked it with the stars because I thought this was a really, really interesting question. And the question is, do you have to be creative to be a good photographer? Um, and I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say yes, but this is one of the reasons I like photography so much and why I enjoy teaching it so much. Yes, you have to be creative to be a good photographer, but I think we're all creative. So that means we can all be good photographers. And one of the awesome things about photography is it's an art form where the tools, our cameras, whether it's a phone or a camera like this, are so capable and we are already such visual creatures that once we have these tools, it is so easy to create something once we put the effort into noticing and understanding composition, understanding exposure, how that affects story, it is so technically easy to then create the things because it doesn't involve, like for me, I, I would love to create paintings and drawings, but there's a signal that gets lost between here and here for me. So it, whatever's in here doesn't translate to here. But this device helps me get what's in here to here. So uh, that's one of the reasons I really, as I mentioned, love photography so much. It's an art form that we, I think just about everybody can participate in uh, with minimal resistance at the beginning and it's something that you can spend the rest of your life learning how to appreciate, enjoy, and, and create more things you really, really enjoy. So yes, you have to be creative, but we're already creative, all of us, I believe. Maybe we haven't, known uh, how we were creative. I know that was true for me. Uh, once I discovered some of these digital tools through computers and cameras, uh, I learned a whole new part of myself in being creative and I'm really, really grateful for that. So uh, yeah, you have to be creative to be a good photographer, but I think we're already all creative. So enjoy becoming a better, more interesting photographer and a more interesting human being along the way. Embrace your creativity and have fun doing it. So there you have some answers uh, to some questions from students in uh, my photography classes this quarter, winter 2022. Uh, I hope you found some maybe interesting information as well as inspiration and motivation in these answers. If you have opinions and other perspectives you'd like to share in the conversation below, I'd be really grateful to receive that and respond to you. Uh, look forward to those conversations. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate it if you'd hit that uh, thumbs up button. That helps train YouTube about videos you like, which is helpful to you. 
also helpful to this channel in maybe getting the word out to more people that they might see this video, which is appreciated. Um, if you really enjoyed this video, you know I have to ask you to subscribe. It's YouTube Law. So please subscribe to this channel. You'll get to see videos once a week where I talk about photography things and share some photos. So look forward to doing that again soon. Uh, I hope you're safe. I hope you're well. And I hope you have a great time creating photos until I see you again next time. So bye for now.